news, functioning democracy completes peaceful transition of power. These days, that's no longer always a given. Germany's story is one of continuity, but also change. Even if the new chancellor is a familiar face, who, truth be told, has been dubbed the schultz mat for his monotone ability to stay on message, Olaf Scholz may sound boring, but the platform of the country's first three-party coalition since the 1950s uh, reads like a manifesto for wholesale reform. The new government, eight women, eight men, it pledges to modernize the economy, manage the next wave of needed immigrants in that country, go green faster, and to do it all on a budget. How much of a transformation can Europe expect change or continuity? A social democrat Schultz takes over from Angela Merkel after first serving as her finance minister in the previous coalition government. The new chancellor's first foreign trip will be on Friday to Paris, where uh, there's a fair amount of Germany envy these days, you might say, uh, while identity politics and personality contests hog the limelight in the early days of the French presidential campaign. We're asking, what can we learn from the Germans today in the France 24 debate? Enter Olaf Scholz. Joining us, Famke Krummuller, executive director of uh, Geostrategy Consultants EY France. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, thanks as well to former diplomat Wilfried Bilevsky, uh, who knows all about pomp and circumstance on days like this one. You were a deputy chief of protocol to two German chancellors. Uh, thanks for being with us again. Pleasure. Uh, with us as well, Matthew Kvordrup, professor of political science at Coventry University and the author of Angela Merkel, Europe's most influential leader. The book dates back to 2016. We'll be asking you, uh, if that was still the case in her waning days. Thanks for joining us. And uh, from Berlin, the philosopher Susan Neiman, director of the Einstein Forum and the author of uh, uh, Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of uh, Evil. Welcome back to the show. Glad to be here. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation, and you have... On Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. 16 years of Angela Merkel, two months of negotiations, and here we are. Mit Ja haben gestimmt 395 Abgeordnete. Olaf Scholz elected Chancellor by his peers uh, in the German uh, Parliament and uh, uh, it was a civic affair. Uh, losers congratulating uh, winners, which is, you could say, standard in Western democracies, at least until Donald Trump skipped Joe Biden's inauguration. Uh, Wednesday's vote, by the way, included a COVID-friendly fist bump between Schultz and the Christian Democrats uh, candidate Armin Laschet, uh, a, a good loser on the day. And that, that, that fist bump... Uh, does that will this surprise you, Wilfred Bilevsky? It, it trended on Twitter that uh, the, the the Germans taking pride in this moment. Times are changing, and uh, you have to adapt, and including in politics. Uh, when you talk about change of leadership, I would uh, distinguish the leader, the person is changing, but the style of leadership remains. Why? And, and because he has experienced two uh, ministries with Merkel. And he is in character rather similar to Ang Angela Merkel. Similar in character to Angela Merkel. So the, the ceremony we saw there and the congeniality uh, between Schultz and Armin Laschet, that for you is normal? Normal. It's a personalized uh, way of treating each other uh, in a respectful way, which, uh, um, which shows the style of German politics nowadays. Of course, Susan Neiman, it's normal in Germany, but not everywhere. Alas, it's not. And if uh, you haven't been following the American news, you will uh, see, or you'll be surprised to see headlines uh, in all of the mainstream papers uh, using words like Republicans prepare for civil war. The danger is far from over. In fact, uh, the Republican Party has become further uh, radical right. I mean, I, I don't even know if radical right is the right term, deeply anti-democratic. And it's, uh, it's a great concern. But in the middle of that, of course, it is uh, a pleasure to live in a country which has a normal 
and even collegial transfer of power. A collegial transfer of power and uh, this sort of the, the moderate niceties, Matthew uh, Kvordrup, uh, until recently, I mean, that was something we associated with uh, the UK politics, here, at least here in France. That was the perception. Uh, yes. And I think in, in uh, to speak up to my own country just for a second, we, we still have uh, an element of civility in, in public life here. They still talk to each other. They're still on first name terms, uh, the political leaders in my country, uh, different though that they are. Um, but I think in Germany, it's, uh, it is a wonderful change. I remember back in, uh, I probably don't personally remember back, when Konrad Adenauer was chancellor and Willy Brandt was the challenger. And Adenauer was not always respectful to his, uh, his colleague there. But it changed. And, and I was there in Germany when, uh, when the Christian Democrats uh, lost to the Social Democrats in, in 1998. I remember Helmut Kohl, the then German chancellor of the CDU, uh, uh, greeted uh, Joska Fischer from the Green Party in the most cordial sort of way. Um, and there was that element of, uh, of civility there. So it, it changed in the, in the 1980s. And it, it's a wonderful thing to see that politics is, uh, is a game where you can be respectful. Um, Gosh, a change towards may more just, civility. Is Susan Neiman? Yeah, may I just add, uh, because it's not something that people like to speak about, um, Adenauer's lack of civility, as it was just described, included campaigning against Brandt with the slogan, what was Herr Brandt doing abroad for 12 years? We know what we were doing in Germany. That is attacking Brandt for exactly the thing that so many people in the rest of the world honored him for, namely emigrating from Nazi Germany. So I, I, I don't consider lack of civility to be a sufficient description of what happened during that 1962 election. Let's turn to today. It was a day in three acts. The Bundestag, uh, we, we saw with that vote, uh, the swearing in of the new cabinet. And then there was the handover at the chancellery between Angela Merkel and the man who served as her finance minister in the previous Grand Coalition. I'm very grateful for what we have done so far. I look forward to the new task. I look forward to all the work here. It will be a new beginning for our country. In any case, I will do everything to work towards that. So this is uh, the, the former underling of uh, the outgoing chancellor praising her work. So there's the message of continuity, and in the same sentence, uh, uh, promising change, Famke Krommel. I think that's exactly what's interesting here, is, the, is to understand how much continuity will we actually see and how much change will we see. Um, of course, as, as was just alluded to, um, there will be a, con a certain continuity in leadership style coming out of Germany, because that, that's the way politics gets done to a certain extent there. Um, but then at the same time, of course, we have first time a three-party coalition at the national level. Um, we have a chancellor who is from a different party, um, from the Social Democrats in coalition with the Liberals and the Greens. Um, so the, all the ministries, um, uh, or a big majority of the ministries, will have changed uh, party. And so there will be change. There will be change in foreign policy, at least in the tone. Um, so it will be interesting to watch. And again, talking about the way this day is, has, has unfolded, uh, when you look at what's only just beginning here in France with a presidential election campaign, Granted, it's different. Uh, you're not running for chancellor here in this country, running for president. Uh, but, you know, when you see the vitriol, when you see uh, the identity politics already on the campaign trail, and you think of what's going on in, in Germany right now, uh, the difference couldn't be starker. But um, Germany and France have extremely different, as you said, um, political systems, right? Because we have a presidential system here in France and a parliamentary system in Germany. So the the politics in Germany necessarily needs to be much more based on um, Co cooperation and coalition forming, as we just said, versus, versus in France is somebody wins and somebody else really loses. Um, and, and that just really forms how the debates work and, and how much confrontation there is, I would argue. The genius of Germany's constitution, you have to cooperate, whereas in France, General de Gaulle uh, wanted a strong leader. Yes, I think we have experience, uh, and that's thanks to Merkel's uh, style of uh, leadership, a time of consensual uh, policy making. 
she is known and will remain known for two concepts. One is the principled pragmatism that she practiced, and the other one is the emotional intelligence for problem solving or damage control. Everybody considers Merkel to be a uh, um, scientist, scientist uh, by at heart. She is scientist at her head, but not at her heart. She has shown in several crises how she tackles problems with emotional intelligence. The welcome um, um, policy is one example, and there are other uh, examples of uh, the COVID reconstruction um, fund where the humanity uh, has uh, overcome fiscal concerns. Um, the uh, welcome culture was a typical example of the, re the, uh, the trial of rehabilitation and redemption of German history. Yeah, but the criticism leveled against her during her 16 years was that uh, she managed crises or she'd make the right decision after waiting a long time. And uh, this wasn't somebody who uh, was proactive on these crises. No, you don't have to be pro proactive to be successful. She showed that it needs time to reflect and time to act. All right, a sign of, well, how Germany has changed. You can just look at the pictures. There was no COVID 16 years ago. During the last time we had a handover of chancellors, mm -hmm. uh, then you have the staff applauding. They're all standing one next to the other. Uh, the applauding the outgoing Gerhard Schröder of the Social Democrats and the incoming Angela Merkel, who at 51 was about to enter the history books. A warm thank you. You can rest assured that I will take good care of this office and the things that made you the Chancellor of Germany you were and whom the people will remember fondly. Matthew Kortrup, you can rest assured I will take good care of this office. Your thoughts on, on that day 16 years ago and how it compares to what's how we just unfolded now? Well, I think what is interesting about what happened that many years ago was a lot of people did not believe she was capable of doing it. Uh, I remember Helmut Kohl had said she can't do it, she can es nicht. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course he, he had his own scores to settle with Angela Merkel. So I think a lot of people were quite... Uh, surprised when she became successful. She became Person of the Year for, by the Times, uh, Time magazine, two years afterwards, and she went from strength to strength. And I think what has been interesting about her throughout her years, uh, when I first wrote my book, and it came out in 2016, then I updated it recently and, and tried to sort of look at if, if anything had changed, and has been quite consistent in that uh, prevaricating style. There was a book in German published a few years ago called Die Sauderkünstlerin, which basically translates as the, as the artist of procrastination. And she turned it into an art form to wait and to sort of wait, read all the facts, understand the issues, and then pounce once uh, it was, she had made a decision on the basis of facts. In 2015, uh, the young person word of the year was to Merkel, Merkel, which signified that you uh, take your time, you get, gather the evidence, and then you make uh, up your mind. And I think in a time where a lot of people are governing by tweet, it is quite refreshing and, and positive that you have somebody who has a scientific mind, who bases things on facts, and who governs more by spreadsheet than by tweet. By spreadsheet I, than by tweet. Susan Neiman. Yeah, I think it's necessary to add a little note of skepticism um, in, in this history. Um, even I, at the moment uh, when she's leaving, feel uh, a certain amount of, oh, gratitude and uh, concern vis-a-vis -vis Angela Merkel. But it's worth pointing out that she's much more admired in, uh, in the rest of the world than she is in Germany, that the so-called scientific... Uh, way of governing looked very, very strong in response to Donald Trump. I mean, she became something of an international hero because she was seen as a counterpoint to Trump. But there are an awful lot of things that remain undone and also forgotten. 
uh, even going back only to 2015, she uh, she waited quite a bit. She followed public opinion before she issued her famous "We will let them in." Uh, Willkommenskultur. The Willkommenskultur, the welcome culture, was very much a grassroots phenomena, and she has not followed up with a very strong and serious and far-ranging policy for refugees. In fact, one of the things that she did in order to avoid any more trouble from the right is to make a pretty Faustian bargain with uh, Turkey's Erdogan, uh, which is where many refugees are languishing now. So um, while I know that what she did was to steer Germany through a, a difficult world in which nothing horrible happened to Germany. Um, I can't help hoping that our new government will be more proactive and uh, more serious about confronting problems before they're, uh, you know, too large to to be confronted seriously. Yeah, uh, the the uh, how much uh, you uh, show solidarity uh, with refugees and uh, what's your immigration policy? Uh, how much you show solidarity with Europe? Uh, those are some of the things that are spelled out in that coalition uh, roadmap, which in Germany takes on the air of a sacred text. Uh, they call them treaties, in fact. And uh, the one that the new government has written is ambitious. It's got to reconcile a big push to modernize Germany with pledges to watch the bottom line. Ellen Gainsford has that story. Germany's new traffic light coalition promises to dare more progress. Social Democrat Olaf Scholz will have to balance the agendas of the progressive Greens and the pro-market Free Democrats. But his first challenge will be tackling the country's aggressive fourth Covid wave. Wenn die gute Zusammenarbeit, die während der Zeit der Bildung der Regierung schon geklappt hat, dann auch weiter klappt, dann wird das eine sehr, sehr und wir vergessen dabei nicht, während wir mit dem Aufbruch beginnen, haben wir noch eine schwere Aufgabe zu bewältigen, nämlich die Corona-Krise zu bekämpfen. Und das wird unsere ganze Kraft und Energie fordern. Scholz is in favor of mandatory vaccination and wants lawmakers to vote on the issue before the end of the year. His first trip abroad will be to France, which is set to take over the EU's rotating presidency in January. Scholz has said he wants to shore up Germany's cooperation with NATO and the transatlantic alliance. Analysts say he's likely to talk tougher on Russia and China than his predecessor, but his actions won't be dramatically different. While domestically, tackling climate change will be high on the agenda. Darüber hinaus allerdings gibt es die großen strukturellen Veränderungen, die im Zentrum der Regierungsarbeit stehen werden. Und das ist sicherlich vor allem die größte Industrienation Europas, die viertgrößte Volkswirtschaft der Welt auf eine klimaneutrale. Scholz is fiscally conservative and plans to return to a no new debt policy by 2023. Taking over from Angela Merkel, he has large shoes to fill, but his predecessor says she will sleep soundly, knowing he is her replacement. So, Famke Krummiller, uh, can you um, at the same time put solar panels on every roof possible, as they're saying, shut down the coal mines, uh, go digital uh, throughout the country? and return to the fiscal purity that's written in Germany's constitution? It is certainly a very ambitious program, and it's true. A lot of questions have been asked around how this will be financed, because, of course, we have on the one side um, the Social Democrats and the Green in government who are very much in favor of uh, more spending and financing, uh, let's say, the, the energy transition or transition to a more um, carbon-neutral economy. And at the same time, we have uh, the Liberals, who will actually be in charge of the finance ministry, um, who are very much in favor of uh, maintaining what you just mentioned, the debt break, which is actually in Germany's constitution. Bad news for the EU if they want to do more pooling of debt like they did during the COVID pandemic? Again, there, it's not that straightforward because, of course, we have the Liberals in charge of the finance ministry, but we also have a social democratic chancellor and the Greens in government. So on all of this, they will need to find compromise. 
And Famke, let me ask you, the, the, the way they write those party, they spent two months not talking much about actual government portfolios, if I'm correct. They spent two months writing down what they're going to do over the next uh, four years. If they stick to it, will that mean, of course, that they are more proactive than, than Merkel ever was? Well, I mean, all German governments have this uh, coalition treaty in place that they have carefully negotiated and then seek to implement. It's 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 an agreement between the parties and, and aims to ensure that um, the government doesn't fall down, which happens in other countries to coalition governments, but hasn't happened in Germany. So to a certain extent, the idea is that this guarantees um, stability and a certain level of proactivity. But as we have seen in the previous years, it will also always depend on um, the crisis and the external environment and things that you maybe hadn't for, haven't foreseen while you negotiated this treaty. Wilfried Bulewski? As a practitioner, I would like to sound a warning against proactive expectations. Nowadays, especially when they are, when they are linked to um, uh, visions, concept, and ideology, neither of this plays a role today in t today's uh, problem solving or um, policy of every day. The world... So, so, what, so what you're saying that are you saying that the, the platform that's been yeah. agreed to mm -hmm. is a little bit detached from reality? No, it may be the reality of yesterday. It may even be the reality of today, but it's not the reality of tomorrow. Tomorrow is made of unpredictability, faster changes, interdependencies, unforeseeable crises. So what you need is a crisis susceptibility, and that was the strongest point of Merkel's uh, uh, governance, a crisis susceptibility and open-mindedness to unforeseen things uh, and innovative thinking to react towards them. Yes, yeah, Susan Neiman, uh, what's on paper uh, is all well and good, but uh, this is a world that's going ever faster. Uh, will the new government be able to react on the fly? Look, I think being able to respond to crisis is absolutely correct. We don't know what's uh, what's around the corner. That is certainly true. But I think it is... Uh, I, I have to disagree uh, with uh, the last... ...that, uh, if I understood him correctly, uh, proactive thinking is a problem. If uh, if that were true, we would not have the climate crisis that we have right now. We have the climate crisis because everyone put it off um, because they were dealing with a more immediate crisis. And as we all know, if we simply read the newspapers, uh, the earth would be in a lot better shape had that not been the case. My concern with the new government is that we have... Um, the Green Party, who are acutely aware, in fact, they were founded, uh, you know, in order to deal with what was not yet a crisis in the climate change. Um, by the way, I should say I don't vote for the Green. I haven't vote for the Greens, but I'm glad that there's a red-green coalition. Uh, I'm quite concerned about the role of the Liberals because what is not in the coalition agreement is how we're going to square the circle of taking very proactive action on climate change while neither raising taxes nor making new debt. And um, people carefully avoided that issue. I understand we needed a government, but that is still the big question. Still the big question, uh, Famke Krummiller, it, it, again, it's interesting because we don't know how that's going to play out, but, all, but you can't help but notice again as we're having this discussion, the stark contrast. In France, we're talking about identity. In Germany, we're talking about climate change. Yes, this is it's extremely interesting. Um, I, I did check the latest polls on in both countries. And what I find very interesting is that in France, when you actually ask people what their biggest concern is and what what the main issue is that they are concerned about going into the presidential election next year, they actually say purchasing power um, by 45 percent. And then only the, ne the next issue then starts to be security and immigration at 30%, so big gap. Um, so the only conclusion here that we can have is that actually the public debate um, driven by, by politicians it doesn't necessarily reflect public sentiment. Um, compared to Germany, where number one concern is by far climate. Um, Especially after the, the big floods we had this past summer. 
So it's it's just very different priorities. Second, then afterwards comes inflation and education. So there you see purchasing power and inflation, I would say, are similar. But um, it's interesting to see that the French debate, public debate um, that we had over the past couple of, of uh, weeks doesn't even necessarily reflect um, because we had a lot of focus on security and immigration rather than necessarily purchasing power. And again, Matthew Kodrup, uh, it, it's the sense that Britain is more like France than Germany. Well, Britain has a majoritarian political system, which is uh, basically sort of a, a North Korean uh, system with elections. If you win, you can do everything. I mean, the British Constitution is, is eight words, whatever the Queen in Parliament decides is law. Um, so therefore, in Britain, you don't really need to have that sort of level of consensus. And it's largely the case in France as well. Whereas in Germany, it is a system where you need to have the, the, the buy-in from the lender, the states, uh, and you also have a coalition government. So the art of German politics, the art of negotiation, but it's also the art of actually sometimes having to, to trim your sails with prevailing winds. Um, and that's the thing that Angela Merkel was very good at, and that's what we see also at the, at the Land level, at the state level, uh, where there are uh, coalitions. But I'd like to come back to something that was talked about before, with Merkel being a scientific chancellor. Uh, there have been a number of situations where she has followed that approach, but interestingly, when it came to, came to the phasing out of nuclear power, uh, uh, a subject on which she actually has a doctorate, uh, she made a, a very quick decision that in some ways turned out to be a, a problematic one uh, because it has increased Germany's uh, energy insecurity and an element of reliance on Russia uh, and, 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 and left, to, left a number of problems unsolved that have to be dealt with now. So much as Merkel in many ways was a, a pragmatic politician who was able to deal with what British former Prime Minister Macmillan called events, you know, events and everything that just happens, um, on occasions, she departed from that and made decisions that are not yeah, She did it on occasion uh, d depart from it. And uh, now, uh, as we head uh, on day one uh, to, to, uh, to what, what lies ahead, a lot of mention was made of COVID uh, in those remarks. And again, it's that I, I want, Susan Neiman, your thoughts on this, on uh, uh, Ger Germans, Germany's democracy uh, which uh, proved uh, an asset during the early days of the COVID pandemic when we were in this country waiting for top-down decisions uh, over where you are. Uh, there was more local initiatives uh, that helped get uh, testing underway uh, that uh, was a bit smarter uh, about detect early detection. And yet now uh, we're seeing that when we're getting into the vaccination bit, uh, you, instead of having an order from above, you have to agree with 16 regional leaders. Well, um, Germany has a very strong federal system, uh, unlike France and unlike England. Um, and that was deliberate in the German constitution that um, an enormous amount of power goes to the federal states. This was exacerbated and um, became very problematic because we had an election this summer and no party wanted to be the party that was warning that, you know, this nice summer that we had, which was basically COVID free and fairly normal, this nice summer uh, could uh, precede a very dangerous fall and winter. Uh, the scientists were saying that the politicians were not, no one was. And uh, now we have the worst COVID numbers that we've had during the entire pandemic. There's another problem of, and, and so that was simply a problem that there wasn't enough top down. I think uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel would have loved to have a much more unified uh, response, and it simply wasn't possible to be top down. And the new so chancellor that on that point is going to vote. Is, says he's in favor when they when the vote comes up, and it could happen in the next couple of weeks uh, for a vaccine mandate for German citizens. Yes, and uh, it's a particularly good sign, and it was a surprise that he chose Karl Lauterbach who's uh, a politician, but he's got a PhD in public health from Harvard, and he's been speaking out about uh, COVID uh, for quite minister. some time. 
Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't clear uh, that he was going to become health minister until Monday. And I'm quite relieved that he is because he's quite tough and he knows the science. The other problem, however, is is really quite interesting. Germany, um, in many ways, and this is uh, something that I wrote my last book about, has a extreme concern for anything that looks authoritarian, um, precisely because of its past history. But that has led in the German case, you know, uh, and among different sectors of the population, both right and left, to, um, you know, a kind of allergy to, to vaccination, which is quite shocking and quite disturbing. I mean, the, the people who are driving up the, col- the COVID numbers are, uh, you know, the vast majority are unvaccinated. And it's not only the COVID numbers. Um, we're worrying about hospitals being uh, so overburdened that ordinary emergencies can't be taken care of. Hmm. Let's hope that the uh, new coalition takes that on. They will have to. It is right now the... Um, you know, the m- most in-your-face question in Germany. It affects everyone. Yeah, hence that possible vote in the in the coming weeks about vaccines. Um, and COVID is one crisis. Germany in the headlines on uh, day one for the new chancellor uh, over another crisis. This one uh, to the country's east, the now not now completed but not yet active Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which runs uh, from Russia through the Baltic st- Sea, into Angela Merkel's home constituency, by the way, at the heart of the current standoff over Ukraine. The Financial Times quotes U.S. and Western diplomats as saying that uh, Joe Biden is uh, putting the pressure on Berlin Berlin, not to open the tap. Uh, a U.S. official saying the new German government is expected to be, quote, more helpful to the U.S. pressure campaign. Wilfried Bolesky. A very difficult task. Germany needs the energy. Germany needs a very good uh, relationship with uh, Russia as a neighbor and as a historical um, opponent. So the the, uh, North Stream in itself as a problem has, by the way, not been mentioned in the uh, coalition uh, agreement. It is left open. Uh, And it will be left open in the uh, play in the political power play around Ukraine for quite some time. And uh, Matthew uh, Kvartrup, uh, uh, we were, were talking about this uh, on this very set 24 hours ago. Germany's losing a, a, a Russian-speaking chancellor uh, who could, uh, who could uh, they say, talk uh, with Vladimir Putin directly. How far did that get Angela Merkel? And will Olaf Scholz be at a disadvantage? I don't think he will be necessarily at a disadvantage. I think he will have different priorities. I think there are two things that are very important here. Of course, uh, Vladimir Putin also speaks German uh, and speaks it rather well. He was he was uh, stationed as a KGB man in Dresden uh, when he uh, when he had a, a day job. Uh, but I think the more important thing is that the Green Party, when they were last in government, they were very vocal in their criticism of, of then it was uh, Schlopper and Milosevic. Uh, and Lina Bierbrock, as foreign minister, will be uh, certainly, in her rhetoric, be rather critical of, 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 uh, of Russia and of China. Uh, and that is going to be very, very interesting, because the, at the end of the day, the German constitution says, Article 65, if I remember correctly, that the chancellor lies out the guidelines of, of policy, I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, and I think Scholz, being a social democrat, uh, has traditionally been from the party which is more open to co- collaborating and uh, with, with with Russia and be more open to Russia. And I think it's going to be interesting to see that power struggle within the coalition. I think that uh, we can expect a tougher line, but the problem is, and it comes back again to the mistake, I think it was to have the, the inner given, the, the uh, end of, of nuclear power uh, under the Merkel government, that they had that meant that, as I said before, Germany became uh, vulnerable to pressures from Russia. Uh, and, and that is the last thing that Germany needs. So the, all the, the problems that we possibly may have in Ukraine uh, is, is not good news for, uh, for Germany. 
that could be one of the first tests of what they actually do uh, when we have a full-blown crisis, possibly a Soviet January. Of course, Nord Stream 2 is, is uh, and the U.S. is putting pressure, again, uh, on Germany. But Nord Stream 2, if it becomes operational, uh, it's uh, gas not just for Germany, for Yes, and it, it does highlight, in my view, the whole Nord Stream 2 debate highlights um, really the challenge that Germany, but also the EU, as you just say, are, are, are facing in terms of the relationships with the rest of the world. And this is um, not only Russia, it's also China, um, to a certain extent, the US, this idea that there is a certain level of, let's call it dependence, um, or trade or cooperation, and then there is a there is a certain level of um, disagreement on um, human rights, for example, and 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 other behavior that these states might have, and where um, Germany and the EU need to try and square the circle between that dependence and um, and um, a value based foreign policy, as they always claim they have. Because you heard Matthew Kortrup say, um, increasing. Uh the energy insecurity of uh, Germany, getting rid of one source of power, nuclear, without yet being able to replace it. Uh, on the other hand, it's been politically popular, that decision. Yes, that's exactly right. It has been uh, politically popular. And um, I, again, I think it shows that we have challenges in, in today's policymaking that are about squaring the circle, to use that again, um, where we 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 need to um, advance on the energy transition. We need to um, implement policies that deal with climate change, and then at the same time, of course, the, these need to be financed. Um, and there are there are international dependencies um, that need to be dealt with in one way or another. And in in the world in which we're currently living, where we move towards more um, regionalization and and, and more. Uh, let's say, favoring of national interests in certain regions, that just becomes increasingly uh, complicated. Uh, Susan Neiman, uh, on Friday, will be the first foreign trip of the new chancellor. He'll be coming here to Paris, um, uh, which is a tradition. Uh, the, the German chancellor always, uh, uh, just like the French president, a new French president always goes to Berlin before anybody else. Um, the man who right now sits in the Elysee Palace, he's in favor of uh, Europe having more strategic autonomy, having its own defense force, uh, more Europe. Uh, again, you were talking earlier about the balance of power in Germany. Uh, how much more Europe do the Germans want? That's a really hard question to answer um, because there's a lot of ambivalence about having power in Germany. Again, this goes back 76 years, that ambivalence. Um, but there's certainly forces in the country who do see that, uh, first of all, uh, Germany, there's, n there's no ambivalence about wanting to be part of Europe in Germany. You don't see the sort of uh, really, except on the very far right uh, and occasionally on the far left, you don't see the kind of ambivalence that you have in, in Britain or Poland about the EU. Germany very much wants to be a part of Europe. Um, although it's often shied away from taking a leadership role in German in Europe, I'm hoping that will change, because again, I believe very strongly that with developments in the rest of the world, and they include the very uncertain state of democracy at this moment in the United States, I think Europe is. Um, to quote an American president, uh, last best hope for humankind. And I hope very much uh, that, uh, that this coalition will strengthen that sense. Famke Kromeller, should, should, should Germany remain, uh, as The Economist once headlined on its cover, uh, the reluctant hegemon of Europe, <laughs> or, or should it step up to the plate? It's 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 a question that is increasingly being debated also in the in the German foreign policy circles around how much responsibility do you need to take up as Europe's strongest economy, for example, and um, and there is there is of course an element of history here um, where Germany is, is is the reluctant hegemon to a certain extent, but then also um, we start to move away from that history and um, the younger generation also of politicians comes to power and maybe has a different vision of this. Wilfried Brolewski? I think what we can expect from Olaf Scholz uh, in his uh, previous uh, um, words of European sovereignty is leading from behind. 
he will not be so there'll switched. be continuity on that indeed all right yes that's oh. what he has learned from Merkel, and that's what he will profess okay with that prediction we are uh, out of time unfortunately i want to thank you so much for joining us i want to thank as well famco crummler uh, matthew cordrup i also want to thank susan neiman thank you for being with us here in the france 24 debate